Good morning. I said good morning. <laughs> oh, it's so good to be in the Lord's house this morning, you know, and I see, I look back through there and I see your faces and I see masks, unfortunately, but uh, that's just part of uh, life right now. I also see scaffolding and I see all these things, but you know what, we got so many things to praise God for. So let's stand to our feet and uh, let's sing. We're going to be singing uh, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Um, words will be on the screen. Let's just all sing for the Lord this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly sing that one more time and let's really sing it to the Lord this morning. You know, it's one thing for us to come together and just sing and listen, but uh, let's sing it as if we have an audience of one. So let's sing that one more time. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much, Lord, for, for loving us, God, and sending your Son for us. Father, I pray that uh, as we come together, Lord, as, uh, as your church this morning, Father, I pray that you would uh, bless this time, God, that, that you would be lifted high this morning. God, we, uh, we ask that uh, you would speak to us, Lord, that you would uh, begin to move among hearts and minds right now, Lord, as we pray. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray, amen. If you'll just remain standing, uh, we're going to sing uh, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace. To trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple grace to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus. Just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply striking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee. Precious Jesus, 
Savior friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust him more. All right, thank you. You may be seated. Uh, we're going to sing a couple of new songs this morning. And, uh, you know, we've uh, had a lot of changes and a lot of things that's taken place over the past few weeks and months due to COVID um, that has really changed our music ministry. Obviously, you're seeing a lot of changes happen in the back of the, uh, the auditorium, but... Um, the, we're having to change a lot about the way we're doing our music. Obviously, we have a praise team, and I really appreciate each and every one of them that are up here. And uh, if any of you, any of you, have a desire to come and sing and praise the Lord, all you got to do is come talk to me. I mean, we uh, we do, <laughs> some churches hold rehearsals. Uh, we do not. But uh, uh, so we just want somebody that has a heart uh, to sing for the Lord, and uh, I welcome you. But we're going to sing a song called You're Worthy of My Praise. This song, fantastic lyrics, uh, just an awesome worship song to God, uh, but it's actually, it has a men's part and it has a, a, a woman's part, so uh, it simply repeats and then everyone joins in on the chorus. So uh, this morning I'm going to let you just kind of sit and relax and listen to the words and learn this song and uh, just listen as we sing along. He is worthy of 
our praise. Amen. Amen. So next song that we're going to sing, many of you may know this song. It's Open the Eyes of My Heart. Does anyone know that song? Anybody? Yeah, all right. There's a few. All right. So if you know the song, sing along with us. But uh, just jump in. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just seek you this morning. God, we seek to see you, God, in your holiness. Father, help us to, uh, to Lord, to just set aside the distractions and, and the thoughts of today. Father, maybe of the week, maybe concerns that we may have. Father, just focus our attention solely on you this morning. God, to, to just pull back the curtain, Lord, to allow us to see you in your glory. Father, you are so holy and you are so worthy. And, Lord, I pray. Uh, Father, that you would just speak to us and help us to see you for who you truly are this morning. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. If you haven't taken some time, you can turn around and look at all of the uh, everything that's been going on. Uh, it's getting there, and I am really excited to see how it all turns out. And uh, Get everything moved up there. Get us another nice, two new nice bathrooms. It'll be all right. Uh, we're going to start a new series this morning, and it's going to be for Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13 uh, for several weeks, and we're going to be looking at the entire chapter. It's eight different parables of Jesus, and Jesus pretty much lays those out one after another, and he tells these parables. And the purpose of the parables that he was telling was to 
describe what the kingdom of heaven would look like. It describes what his kingdom is going to look like. And, uh, and so the reason that he gave those, and he gave them in one order, uh, right in order, one after another, was there was a misconception in Jesus' day about what the kingdom of heaven looked like. There was a lot of people who felt like because uh, a lot of the people who Jesus was speaking to, which was a Jewish uh, group of people, they believed because they were Jewish, because they were children of Abraham, that they would be automatically uh, considered a part of God's family. And so what Jesus begins laying out is just because you're a uh, child of Abraham or you're Jewish, that doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven. There's, there's a whole lot more that they did not understand, and Jesus begins to explain it or describe it in parables so that they can get an idea of what the requirements were to be a child of his kingdom. And so we're going to be looking at this for the next several weeks uh, about uh, what Jesus' kingdom looks like. But before we get started, I want to do this, because we would, you would think if we were going to look at a chapter, we would start in verse 1. We are not. We're going to start in verse 44. And the reason I want to do this is I want us to look at the end before we start the beginning. Because if you know what you're looking for, you'll know how you got there along the way. If I just take you all on a trip and we say we're going somewhere, you're going to, the first thing you're going to say is, where are we going? Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you where we're going first, and then I'm going to explain how we're going to get there. So that's the purpose in uh, us starting in verse 44. And what I want us to really focus on this morning is how we see Jesus. How do we see Jesus? And we're going to look at two different parables this morning, uh, one being in verse 44, the next one being in verse 45. So verse 44 says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in joy, in his joy, went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Verse 45 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you just be with us this next few moments. Father, help us to look into our own hearts and, and really examine how we see you and what Jesus means in our life. Help us to gain perspective about our world that we live in. Help us to look deep into our own hearts and see what's there, what truly drives us, what we're truly passionate about, what truly brings joy to our life. Help us to look into our own hearts, and if it's not you, Lord, I pray by the end of this service that we'd make that decision to follow you with all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I want to tell you a story before we get too, too far into it, because it kind of was brought on by this whole event uh, that happened in our house, and this actually is the study of this whole chapter. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking at this idea over and over again, but this is what happened. So, uh, I was sitting at the, the kitchen table or somewhere thereabouts, and Jody had just been to the grocery store. And uh, we have a, a little pantry over in the side of, the, the, uh, of our kitchen. And so uh, Anna was in the pantry door looking for crackers or something. I don't know what it was. We'll say it's crackers. And she said, I can't find them. And uh, Jody said, well, they're in there. I'll bought them. And, uh, and Anna says, well, I, I, I don't see them. And she said, well, they're in there. And so uh, Jody walks over to the pantry, reaches down, picks the crackers up, and hands them to her and says this unmistakable thing, which got this whole sermon started. She said, you're just like your dad. <laughs> you can't find nothing. Which I would have been truly insulted had it not been absolutely true. So this is what happened, though. Earlier in that week, and, and, and there, there's a point to this, and we'll get to it in just a second. Earlier in that week, uh, I was weed-eating. I hate weed-eating. How many of y'all hate to weed-eat? I mean, it's just, 
If you weed eat, you hate weed eating, okay? Uh, so I'm out weed eating. It's hot. Uh, I'm all sweaty and everything. And uh, I'm going along, and my weed eater runs out of weed eater cord, okay? And it always happens, right? It either gets tangled up or you run out right in the middle. You just won't get done. So I had to stop. I put the weed eater down. I went into my tool room where I would keep my, my weed eater line. And, you know, it's easy to find. It's a big orange spool that you just can't miss. And it might be yellow, but it's a big orange spool. So I go into my uh, tool room and I look everywhere, up and down, every, every row. I'm, I'm looking because I just bought it. I bought it about a month ago. I had put the line in it one time. I knew that that weed eater line was in there. Couldn't find it. Looked everywhere. Went out to the garage. I spent probably 30 minutes searching through the garage to find this big spool of orange weed eater line. It had to be there. I knew I had it. Went through the garage, spent all this time hunting, hunting, could never find it. And then I said to myself, Self, I did go get Jody, by the way, but she didn't know where my weed eater line was either. I was going to leave that part of the story out. Thanks, so. So I said, Self, it's got to be here. I said, where would I put that weed eater line if I was going to put it up in a place where I could find it again? Because obviously that's what you would do, right? So I went back into the tool room. I said, I would have put it in the tool room, and I would have put it right here. And when I reached out my hand, I picked up my spool of weed eater line. The only problem with it was it was gray. I was looking for orange weed eater line the whole time when the actual color of the weed eater line was gray. It wasn't what I was looking for. Therefore, I could not see it. I could not see it at all. Now, this is actually called something. It's called inattentional blindness and it is they study this in psychology inattentional blindness if you're taking notes it won't matter but we're going to talk about this a lot over the next few weeks it is the condition where your mind focuses on what you believe should happen what something should look like and you focus on it so specifically that you ignore everything else around you. If you've ever went into your pantry before and looked for something, like a can of chili, what color is a can of chili, people? It's red. If you ever put chili in a yellow can, you'll never find it because it's supposed to be red. Everybody knows that. It's called inattentional blindness. And, and it causes us, as we look at the world around us and we look at things, it causes us to have blind spots so that we miss the thing that is literally right in front of us. Uh, if you've ever heard the expression, if it was a snake, it would have... It would have bit you. That's right. If it were a snake, it would have bit you. And, and so we don't see things sometimes. But the problem is... That's the way that many people see Jesus, and they see Jesus in their life. They're not looking for Jesus, therefore they do not see Jesus. And it happens, and it happens all the time. I mean, for a believer, coming to faith in Jesus, it's the most wonderful, it's the most spectacular thing in the world. Why would anybody not want to... Uh, uh, be a Christian and, and fall in love with Jesus. Why wouldn't anybody want to do that? And at the same time, you can have a lost person that looks at them and go, yeah, I don't see nothing there. That's how, because you are not looking for who and what Jesus is. And until you get to, and I asked Andy to sing that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, because very often that's what people need more than anything is to open their eyes up 
to what Jesus is doing around them. Because Jesus is at work all the time, doing things all the time in the world that we live in. And very often we go through life and say, I don't see Jesus doing anything. God's not doing anything in my life. And He's at work all around you. The problem is we don't see Him because we're not looking for Him. Or what He's doing is not what we would expect Jesus to be doing in our lives. And therefore we say, God's not at work in my life. I can't see God anywhere around me. My life is going to, to down the drain and God's not doing anything about it. When in reality, He's at work the whole time. And so very often it's what we focus on in life that draws our attention. If we're expecting God to do, I, I need God to do this. Well, we have such a narrow view of things. If He's doing something outside of that, something we can't even think of or imagine, we miss Him in the process. Is God at work? He is. But do we miss Him? A lot of times we absolutely do because we're looking for the wrong thing. So God is at work. He's at work all the time. Uh, and very often we miss what He does because we're looking at, at and lost people, uh, unbelievers, can't see God in their life simply because they're not looking for Him. In fact, uh, I have an atheist friend who I've talked to several times, and he says, I can only, listen to this, this is, this is his words exactly, I can only believe in what I see, and if I can't see it, then I won't believe it. Okay? Now here's the reality. Can you see God? You literally cannot see God. He's spirit. He's invisible. Therefore, he has, he has concluded there is no possibility for me to know God because I can't see Him. Because He says I can't see Him, He's never going to see Him at work in His life, even though He is. Christians get the same way. We get so narrowly focused that we become willfully blinded to the possibility of what God is doing around us. Just like the orange weed eater line that was gray. He's been there the whole time. We just missed Him. And so it's so important that we spend time looking and see how God's moving in our world and what He's doing so that we can respond to Him when He does. Uh, there's a passage in Ephesians which kind of describes uh, the song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray, listen to this, this is so good. Yes, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you. I pray that your eyes would be open so that you can see God. That should be the, ha the prayer on every person's heart, not only for themselves. God, I want to see you. Before you came to church this morning, that should have been the prayer on your heart. God, I want to see you. I want you to move in a special way in this place right now. And not only that, you should pray it for yourself, but those people who will be here. God, I want you to do a special work in the people's hearts that are around. Open their eyes so that they may see you. Because unless God opens our eyes to that possibility of seeing Him, we will live our lives never looking up. Open, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you. This morning we're going to look at two parables. And uh, we're going to talk about the blind spots that we, that we have where, where we can't see, when we can see, and how a person comes to uh, this relationship with Jesus and what actually happens to, to them. So with the two parables we're going to look at this morning is one man wasn't looking for anything and he finds something priceless. The other man was looking for something specific. He was exacting what he was looking for, and he finds it. Both men realize the value of what they find, and they respond accordingly. So back to verse 44. We're going to look at this first parable. Back to the beginning. Here we go. Verse 44. Here we go. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, and when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy, 
went out and uh, sold all he had and bought the field. All right. So we're going to need a little bit of an explanation onto this parable because there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on here that when we see that, we're just like, man, that's dirty, uh, what this dude did. But, but there's a whole lot of background that will begin to make this make sense. So this is what's happened. In Jesus' parable and in that day, uh, there was no banks. There was no safety deposit boxes. There was nothing like that. And so what would happen is people would take their uh, valuables, uh, they would wait till it was dark with no moonlight, they would take what they had, they would put them in jars, they would go out into their field at night, they would dig a big deep hole, and they would stick it in the ground, cover it back over. And that way, uh, their possessions, their treasure, if it were, would be safely hid from everybody else. Because what would happen in that area of Palestine was very often, if you, if you read very much at all in your Bible, you'll know that they go to war constantly. And so what would happen is when, when uh, uh, an invading army would come in, they would steal all the treasure that anybody had, whether it was uh, uh, their, they would steal their food, they would steal their clothing, they would steal if they had gold. It didn't matter what they had. If it was worth stealing, they'd steal their furniture even. They would take whatever they wanted. And so because there was so much war and things like that that was constantly going on, people were continually, as soon as somebody would, would uh, uh, some invading army would show up, they would take their possessions, they would stuff it in whatever they could find, they would wait till it was dark where their neighbor couldn't see what they were doing, they'd go out, dig a giant hole, put their stuff in the ground and cover it over. And say, yeah, I went sowing some seed last night. Uh, ignore the bald spot. So, uh, so that's what they would do. Well, it came to happen over time that the, the person who buried the treasure either forgot about it or they died without telling anybody about it. And so what would happen then is the treasure would remain hidden for years. Hundreds of years it could be remain hidden. And so the people that it belonged to had long since passed. It was gone. And then what would happen is somebody might happen upon it years and years and years later. And there was a law that was passed because there were so many things that had been found and buried in the ground there was a law that was passed in that day. If you find it in the ground, it's yours. It was the finder's keeper's rule. Okay, If you can find it, you can have it. So what would end up happening then uh, in our parable is this person would have been either walking by the roadside and, and saw some sti something sticking out of the ground or he may have been plowing in a field. It was rightly his at that point. So rather than the man being, when we look at it, rather than the person being completely dishonest, he was actually being quite honest. Because what he does is he goes back, he covers it back over, and he finds out who the landowner is. And when he finds out who the landowner is, then he goes, because he knows what it is, he goes and he sells whatever he has to sell to buy that piece of land where the treasure is. And so that's what's happening in this parable. This person has found something. He was either walking by a field and sees it sticking up out of the ground or he was digging in a field and it gets turned over. One way or the other, this gets turned over and this man finds out uh, or sees what this is. And when he sees it, he sees it as priceless. Now this happens all the time in our day. We just see it in a different way. How many of y'all like to watch the Antique Roadshow? few of you. How many of you hate the Antique Roadshow? Okay, a few of you. All right. So, so this, is what, this is the way it would happen. If you were uh, walking in an antique store and you saw, or let's say, they just had that million mile long uh, uh, yard sale, didn't they? Okay, you go by this yard sale, you see an item that is, let's, let's say it's a an old little car, a little play or something like that. You see this car there, and you know that thing's worth a lot of money. And you flip it over, and they say, $5. And you go, oh, they don't know what they got here. And they, you go to that person and say, how, uh, how much for the little car? And they say, well, it's, it's, it's $5. And they, well, can you do me a better deal on that? And they go, 
Okay, $4. That's it's like, I'll take it. And so you pay the person what they were asking for when, in fact, you know that this car is worth $200. Now, have you done anything wrong when you pay $4 for the $200 car? You have not. You found a treasure, right? Uh, do we have some wheelers and dealers in here? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So this is what happens. So this man finds this treasure that is hidden in a field, which he could have taken on his own because it was within his right. He found it, but then he hides it again. And then, this is so important, in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought the field. Now then, you're not going to do that for a little car. And we aren't told what exactly uh, this man found in the ground. But what he found was absolutely priceless. And he says that in his joy, he goes and he sells everything that he has to buy this piece of land. Because he knows when he does, he has found something that is extremely special, that is extremely valuable, that's worth everything that he has if he can simply buy it. And so that's what's being pictured here. He, he's, he, is, uh, he is searching, he has uh, he is found that he goes and sells all he has, and it says, in his joy, went and sold everything he has. So this is, what this is describing is when a person realizes for the first time who Jesus is. This is what this parable is talking about. It's a comparison between this man finding a treasure and a person finding Christ. Those are the two things that are being laid by, side by side. It says the kingdom of heaven is like this treasure. It's this unbelievable treasure in a field. And when you find it, the first thing that happens to you is that you're filled with joy. Now, that is so important because when a person comes to real faith in Christ, what happens to them? They are filled with joy. Listen, if you can say that you got saved and you never had any joy in your life, you didn't get it, okay? Because that is the expression of what a person who genuinely comes to faith in Christ has. They are filled with an unbelievable joy about having Jesus in their life. There's no way to explain it other than joy. And you see, here's the thing. I've had the opportunity to lead a few people to Christ, and when you do that, there's something that changes in their eyes the moment they receive Christ. It's like, boom! Boom! I, I don't know, there's not words you can... Something just happened. There, there is something that has changed in my life, and that is the joy that they experience when they realize what Christ has done. It's too, way too many Christians go around life all miserable and, 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 and oh, woe was me and all this stuff when our lives should be filled with joy because Christ is the treasure in our life. Amen? There's something that happens to a person when they really receive Christ. You can't explain it. A person who has received Christ cannot explain it. But there is a joy that is filled in that person's life that is unmistakable. He says, and then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. You say, why, if something is that valuable, if something is that precious, that you'd be willing to sell everything you had, if, if there's something that is that important, that you have to have it more than anything in, else in this life, why would everybody not see it that way? If Jesus is that precious, that important, that special in my life, why doesn't everyone want Jesus? Well, the answer is in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. Why don't they see Him? One, they're not looking for Him. But the second thing is, the, the, the God of this age, me and the devil, has blinded their minds so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. They cannot see how glorious, how radiant, how Jesus is the best thing in the world. They cannot see it. And so unless God does a work in that person's life and shows them who they, that He is, and He's around us all the time, unless that person changes their focus and looks to Christ, 
they never see the glory of Christ in their life. They can completely miss Him. And that's how a Christian can be like, whew, and that was the best thing in the world. Man, I love Jesus. Jesus is great. He's my everything. I, 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 live, I live for Jesus. I want to give my life to Jesus. If, 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 here you go. If I could be with God's people in God's house all the time, man, I'd be there every day. That's what I thought. Uh, man, I love Jesus. You know, and that's the way. Is that not how a new believer is? It is exactly how a new believer is. All they want is to be wherever Jesus is. They want to be around God's people. They want to be in God's house, and they're excited to get there. But we lose that because we change our focus little by little until we get to the point where we don't see Him at all. And then it says this, In his joy he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Now what does that mean? Well, salvation doesn't cost you anything because salvation is priceless. There is not a price that you can put on it. But Jesus in his parable was saying, if you could put a price on it, what would you be willing to pay for it? And the idea here is, I would be willing to sell every single thing that I have. I would give away everything I had to give away. I would mortgage my house. I would sell my kids. I would do whatever I had to do to get Jesus. I'll do whatever it takes to get Jesus. The parable of the rich young ruler is very, uh, uh, speaks to this very point. When Jesus told the man, go and sell all that you have, and give to the poor, then come and follow me. What that man had to him was more important than having Christ. He could not see the beauty of Christ, the glory of Christ and everything Christ was. He could not see it because his possessions had his attention. And so he was always weighing things out. And believe it or not, we do this all the time. We weigh things out. Well... I would like to do this for Jesus, but it'll cost me this. Or I, I, I would feel like serving in this way, but it'll cost me this. And, and I, would do, I would do these things, or I would give this money, or I would do this, but it's going to cost me too much. When in reality, if we really saw Jesus as all He is, if we saw the beauty and the glory of Jesus, if we could just see Him as He is, we would say, I'll give it all away if I can get Jesus. And that's what that parable is teaching us is that if you could just get a glimpse of Him, give me a glimpse of your glory. Let me see you. If I could see you for just a moment, just a glimpse, much like what Moses said, I just want to see a glimpse of you. Give me a glimpse of your glory. And when I do, that's all I need. I'll give everything else away. I'll give it all. I don't care about it. I just want you. That's how every believer ought to be. When they see Jesus, I give it all away to get Jesus. This man in this parable found this treasure. He wasn't looking for it. It just popped up to him. There it was, and he had to have it. The second parable we're going to look at this morning it's a parable about a person who was looking for it. He was looking for something specific, and, and we'll go quickly with this one. He was the searcher. Verse 45 says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went and away and sold everything he had and bought it. So the first man was just walking along and discovered this treasure, and this, this treasure is always Christ. The first man walked along and found it. The second man was actually searching for something. Both are uh, pictures of salvation, of someone, uh, someone realizing the beauty and the majesty of Christ. And, and in this parable, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. So this man was someone who deals with it. And this, this guy has... He deals with pearls and he has all kinds of 
of uh, pearls that he buys and he sells. He knows what he's looking for. He knows what he is specifically looking for. And then he finds the one. The one that is better than all the rest of them. The one that is unmistakably different than the rest. The one that is special. And he says, I will take and sell everything that I have to get this one. Now, uh, this guy is someone who is pictured as a searcher. And this, is, this would be someone, in the book I was reading on, it described a, a, a couple. They had been married for, for 20 or 25 years. And they had been searching their entire life for something that made sense. They had been searching their whole life for God. They, and they tried everything. Uh, they tried New Age stuff. Uh, uh, they, they, they'd been Buddhist for a while. They'd been this religion. All these different religions. They tried a little bit of everything trying to find something that made sense. And, and, and no matter what they tried, no matter where they went and what they did, there was always this emptiness inside them that they, they could never get, nothing seemed to fill it. Until they found Christ. They went to a church and they accepted Jesus as their Savior. And they said, this is what we've been looking for. This is what we've been looking for the whole time. And so they had tried everything else. Nothing worked out. Nothing would fulfill them. But the moment they saw the beauty of Christ, they said, we're going to sell it all. We're going to throw the rest away. None of the rest matters. All we want is Christ. All we want is this. And so this is what happens in this parable. This, uh, this merchant who is been looking at all of the different possibilities of life, have tried a little bit of everything. And if you read the Bible about Solomon, he did much the same way. He tried a little bit of everything to find out what would work for him. And he said, all of life is just vanity. It's just a waste of time, really, until you come to that relationship with God, to that relationship with Jesus, when you see him as he is for the first time. You go, wow, God is so good. the devil trying to distract me. He was looking for something that would make sense. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything and bought it. What does salvation cost us? Nothing. It doesn't cost you a thing to come to a relationship with Christ. But there shouldn't be any price that you wouldn't be willing to pay to get him. That's the point of these two parables. It doesn't cost you anything to be saved. But at the same time, you can't hold anything back when you come to God. There's a song. I kept thinking of songs as I was going through this. There's that song, uh, you may know it, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by His nail-pierced hand. If that's truly where our heart is, and it should be. There's absolutely nothing we wouldn't do to have Jesus in our life, to have Jesus in our life more. But what's the problem? We get so distracted by the many, many things around us, we fail to see the beauty of Christ. We fail to see His glory. We fail to see His hand at work in our lives. And we just miss Him. I was talking with someone earlier in the week about this very thing. And they said what they do is they start writing down. They started writing down, journaling what God was doing in their life where they could see it. And they wrote down one thing and another thing just their prayer requests, their thoughts, they just wrote it down. 
And week after week went by and they wrote down what their thoughts were, what was happening, what they would like to see Jesus do. And a few months later they went back and they looked to see what they had asked God about and what they had prayed about. It was a checklist. You could go down. He was there for me. He did that for me. He took care of that for me. He was there. And that's taken care of. How can you say that? Because we can go through life and miss him completely. Because we're not looking for him. But when we look for him, we see him everywhere. Let me ask you, where are you with Jesus this morning? Because he's the most beautiful thing in your life. How'd you rather have him than anything else? Is he more special to you than all your possessions combined? If he's not, you're not where you need to be. And if you've never seen the beauty of Christ and you've never invited him into your life, the first thing you need to do is just say yes to him. Say, come and be my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. And when you do, your life will be filled with a joy that is unbelievable and unmistakable. And if you're not living in that joy at this moment right now, you need to pray right where you are and say, do a work in my life, God. Let me see you for who you are. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for all that you do in our lives. Father, I pray for everyone that's here this morning. If you're not there, everything right now, if you're not the center of their life, if you're not the most special thing that that person has, Father, I pray right now that they would surrender whatever it is to you. That they say, Lord, you can have it. Whatever it is that's standing between me and seeing the beauty and glory of Jesus in my life, I want to give that up. And I won't give it up right now. In my mind, I'm going to hand it over to you. Lord, take it and bring back the joy that I once had in my relationship with you. Bring back the excitement of knowing Jesus. Let me see Jesus again as it were, for the first time. And may my heart be filled with that joy of knowing Him. Father, if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know You as Savior, Father, I pray right now they would invite Jesus into their heart and their life, repent of their sins, and save them. Father, may this be the happiest day of their life, a life that is filled from here on out with joy because of what you mean and what you bring into a person's life. Father, I pray that you'd open the eyes of our hearts that we may see you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, folks, y'all are